Thank you. Thank you so much for for joining again. Thank you very much. Yeah, let me just hide here for for you. Yeah. Maybe I can introduce. I've invited Professor Sadato. He's not connected to Trinity, but he is uh, one of the top uh, experts in Japan. So I invited him also. Yeah. To come on. You know and he knows your work for many, many years. Right. He, uh, he just told me. Thank you for coming. Thank you very much. It is quite uh, exciting for me uh, to, to hear your lecture directly because I have been at uh, I have been familiar with your findings through the papers and the books, but uh, this is the first time to at, uh, at actually speaking at the Ramachandran. Therefore, <laughs> I'd like to uh, enjoy the, uh, the lecture for the uh, next two hours. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting uh, me. Okay. Professor Sadato, he is a uh, professor at the Division of Cerebral, Cerebral Integration at the Department of System Neuroscience okay. at the National Institute for Physiological Science. So it's a national institute of uh, government of Japan, near Nagoya. Mm. And uh, then we have Martin Morris here. Mm. Who is, uh, he's also a Trinity graduate and he's now professor in Chiba University on mm. uh, Japanese architecture. So he is an oh. expert on how Japanese housing developed over the last, how many Two years? <laughs> Two million. Yeah. So I'll, show you something, I'll show you something interesting. Uh, excuse me for one second. Since you said architecture. What I have here is what I have here is so exquisite. I think uh, it's a it's a gastropod gastropod shell. Can you hear? Can you see it? Oh yes, yes, yes. Oh yes. Ah. Oh. And it's it's from Japan. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting when you look at it. It looks Japanese. Mm. Yes. Well, right? also that kind of shell was the inspiration for the Guggenheim that Frank Lloyd Wright de uh, designed in New York. So it has been mm -hmm. used as an an architectural generator. But okay, spirals yeah. play a exactly. part, actually, in Japanese design. When they laid out, for example, the city of Edo, which is now Tokyo, mm -hmm. actually, the, the design starts with the castle and it unwinds like a spiral. But it's interesting that you, you, it, looks, it looks Japanese. You think that's only because you, you've seen Japanese buildings built after this model. The model after the shell, or do you think it's a coincidence, or do you think there's mm. some other conversion? <laughs> Very interesting. Anyway, that's a, an aside there. But... Thank you. Mm. So, yeah, I like, you'd like me to begin now, or? Yeah. Uh, if you like, we can start. Mm. Yes, if you like. Yeah. Uh, there are many more people who have registered, but ah, there's some coming more. Mm. There should be more coming, but you know, let's start and they will uh, join. I don't, is it just me, but I'm finding it very difficult to hear. Uh, the sound is very low. I can hear you, but uh, uh, Professor Ramachandran's sound is very low. Is uh, that Ma just me? Uh, Maurice, uh, is Maurice there? Yeah. Uh, could you help? Apparently the sound, for me it's okay, but Martin says that the sound oh, is- Hang on, shall I try putting in another? I'll try putting in another speaker. Yeah, maybe it's on your side, you know. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's better. It's quite maybe muffled maybe. here as well. That's better. <laughs> yeah, yeah for, for me, it's good. Okay, let, let, let me make sure that it's, it, you can understand what I'm saying too. I mean, is it, is yes, clear? yeah. Okay, I can hear you now. Thank you. Late, late, lately, my speech has been slightly deteriorating, so you can ask me to repeat myself. I'd be happy to do that. Because we have so much time, an hour and a half, it's okay to interrupt and say, please. Okay. 
Uh, if you like, uh, uh, do you like to start? Uh, I'm. Uh, whatever you suggest, you know, because you master ceremonies. You want me to start now? We can do that, or we can. Start uh, a little bit. Yeah, we can start now. Yeah, sure. If if it's okay, we can start, and okay. I think maybe Maurice can help you set up the the slides. No, it's all set up. Okay. I need uh, permission to share the. Screen. Ah yes, just one second. I have to set that up. Yes, mm -hmm. just one second. Uh, Okay, should work now. Okay. Can you try? Yes, I am able to. I believe the slides are this one. Or actually, what I'll do first is I will go here. And this one? Yes, that's, this is the correct one. Okay. Oh. Does that look good? Uh, yeah. The other uh, one small point, formal point is, uh, can I ask you for permission? I'm recording this and then mm -hmm. I would like to publish it on the Trinity in Japan website and the college will also put it on their website and so on. Is that okay? 99%. If it doesn't go well, then of course we can change our mind and we can do it in a private recording entity, but overall it's fine. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Great, thank you. Um, really? Okay. Do you see the slides moving? Yeah, they're moving, yeah. changing. Well, I need to make sure I'm sharing the correct uh, screen. I think I can see your desktop with the PowerPoint. Oh, really? and the mm. brain. Okay. Yeah, I think if you do it full screen, I think it's maybe better. Mirror, mirror thing, mirror, mirror. Okay. Uh, give me one second to. Another yeah. show? I think it's another show. Yeah, that's what I am. So what I'll do is I'll stop sharing. This is the correct one. This is the IRS. Can you see it now? Yeah, perfect, perfect, perfect. Yes, full Good. screen fine. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Let me go back to the beginning. Okay, thank you very much for your kind invitation. Wonderful <laughs> to be back here in Trinity. Not Westwood Trinity, I should say. For a while, I was confused, confused about the time difference. And you said Trinity. I said, how's that going to work? And then, and then I realized it's, it's actually being, most, most of you are in one place. In, in, most of you are in Trinity. In Tokyo. I'm in Tokyo, in Japan. You're in Tokyo. And Tokyo, in Japan. Yeah, most of the audience is from Tokyo? Or? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, uh, there, there are some there. participants of, uh, the participants are from all over the world. But in, I'm in Tokyo, and it's essentially like Trinity organization in Japan, which I'm, I've am i started building up seven years ago. And oh. with a virus crisis now, we've, I've started about a year ago to do it by Zoom, so we can do it global. Excellent. Yeah, great idea. I should, I should start doing something like it. You know? So please so join our next, there will be Professor... Baron Cohen, who will be talking on autism as well. So if you want to join, that would be fantastic. I'd like to do that. He's outstanding. I love his work. You know. so I'd like to come to him. I, you mentioned him in, in one of your books I've seen. And I'll send you the link so you can please join. It will be fantastic if you can join. Sure. I'll try to do that. Thank you. So uh, I was asked to give a short autobiographical thing, like five minutes. I won't bore you with a long... <laughs> long that is a story, but and then go on to the research is much more important. But the autobiographies of, of scientists are usually quite boring if you think about it. You think the guy has done very exciting research, he must be a very interesting person, but it's not always true. Okay. Sometimes it's true, but not always. So I was trained in, uh, I went to Bangkok, my father was a diplomat, 
in the United Nations. He was a child that was quite, so felt a bit isolated, different from other children. And as a, as a little boy, or as a you know, big boy, in my early teens, I was feeling isolated. So I was not athletic, I was not involved in par parties and all that. I was more by myself. But I had one good friend, Somtao Susiratko, who's a, a in the royal family in Thailand. He was in the same school, the Bangkok Patana School. So then we often would go fossil hunting or shell hunting or all of these interesting things for me we found it interesting. This is to give you a glimpse of what I was like very early in, in, in my boyhood. Then, then when I went to high school, then I started to become more interested in science. We were very good science teachers, both in Bangkok and in India. They would bring, for example, chemistry. I was fascinated by chemistry because she would give us these colored, colorful chemicals, of course. So take it home and play with it. And it would never happen this day and age because people are worried about insurance, worried about being sued and all that. But those days, she would give us some chemical, small quantity, and go play with it. One of the things I remember really vividly is putting a, a, a nail, an iron nail, in copper sulfate solution is blue. After some time, the nail becomes copper. And this is amazing. How, did, how is this possible? She explained the idea of displacement and all that. And that, that sort of thing got me hooked. Anomalies. I, I used to call them anomalies. Something that doesn't simply, in that, that case, an anomaly about the world. Why would something put in a blue liquid become gold colored? Then, then I started thinking about more, more seriously about anomalies as, as, I, as I grew older and joined college. I was always drawn to the exception. It may not be a good, good strategy for many scientists, but it worked for me. So you go for exceptional, exceptional cases. Like, for example, uh, the standard example is continental drift, of course, which you all know about continental drift. Uh, then, then there are other examples like uh, bacterial transformation, where you get bacterium, pneumococcus, one strain, changing into another strain. How is this possible? Then, then I ask, what, which, many anomalies are fake. You can take uh, telepathy. You can study that for 20 years and waste your time. Now, I shouldn't say this in, in Trinity, of course, because they do have a, <laughs> a niche for that, even for that. But uh, in general, the telepathy does not work. It doesn't work. It's bogus, right? Similarly, spoon bending from a distance is bogus. So how do you know which anomaly is going to give, go, give, lead to a gold mine which anomaly is something you have to brush under the carpet and forget about? Don't waste your time on it. How do you know? Because if you, if you discover the right one, you change the whole course of physics or chemistry or any, any science. You, you discover a gold mine. You discover some trivial thing, you're wasting your time. And there are some rules of thumb you can apply. One is an intuition, a sort of nose for anomalies. By anomalies means something that doesn't fit the picture. In the Kuhn sense, Thomas Kuhn sense. Then you have to revise the whole model. Or you have to press it into the carpet, pretend it doesn't exist up to a point. Then it becomes more and more glaring, and then you sort of say, I, I can't do this, I can't do this denial anymore. <laughs> There's something interesting going on here. Then you latch onto it. One one rule is if an anomaly is around, but resists attempts to disprove it. Then then it's worth paying attention. But it, it becomes smaller as it, each time you try it, it becomes smaller. It, it, con conditions are more and more controlled. The, the so-called anomaly becomes more, more and more small, vanishingly small. Then it's, then it's bullshit. They start saying, oh, the weather is not right. You have to go only on summer morning, then it works. You're only when the moon is aligned, with it, then it works. They start making excuses, then you're in trouble. Then you forget about it, move on. Right? That's number, rule number one. Rule number two, but don't ignore something simply because it does not fit the big picture of science. That's one common reason people reject an anomaly. Because it's very often, but it's true that it's a waste of time. It's a false alarm. But it's very often it's, it's really not a false alarm. If you pursue it, it leads to you, leads you to go discover it. Right? And uh, so what would be an example of that? Continental drift is a good example. The people said, the, you know, the, Wagner, the, the meteorologist said that how come the boundaries of the continent fit so perfectly? Any child must have asked this. Lots, lots of children ask teachers, school teachers. Where does the boundary fit? And Kulti says, well, this is a coincidence. But this guy persisted. And then, then the pundit said, look, it's not a perfect fit. It's only approximate. It's then when he did this sounding of the underwater, then the perfect, it become better and better as it go deeper. Why? Because there is surface erosion. The land, the, the water erodes the surface. The surface fit is not very good. But when you go deep, in the, deep underwater, there's no turbulence, the fit is better. 
he got these clues, and then he got a clue that, that the dinosaurs, there's a creature called um, Mesosaurus, Mesosaurus, freshwater lizard, found only in the east coast of Brazil. Sorry, yeah, east coast of Brazil, west coast of Africa. Only two places in the world is found this, but soft, freshwater lizard. So they said, um, so Wagner said there must have been, since they can't, they can't swim across seawater, these two must have been one continent, South America and Africa. And there's a freshwater lagoon, this, this fish, this, this lizard thrived there in the Permian, and then the drift occurred, and then, you know, the, the fossils are found there. They, they didn't find, the compounders didn't find this very convincing, until they talk about dinosaurs. Dinosaurs, the same genera and families, you find west coast of, uh, uh, east coast of Brazil, west coast of Africa. They said, the pundit said, well, look, there's a land bridge. They must have crossed the bridge and then died at the other end. This to me is much more <laughs> absurd than, than the notion that, that the continents were together. But at that time, people didn't know. And so the reason they rejected it, why did they reject it? Because it contradicted one basic principle of geology, which is that terra firma. One, one thing you take for granted is Earth is solid and firm, psychologically. To say that the continents are moving, you cannot, you cannot conceive a mechanism. That's the key. Don't throw away an observation. It is there, staring at you, all these observations that we told you about. But you're rejecting it only because you cannot think of a mechanism. Because, because there may be a mechanism you don't know about. You haven't discovered yet. So that's number two. So anyway, I, I was very fond of history of science, prematurely. You're supposed to be fond of history of science when you're 70 or 80. But I was fond of it prematurely. It was, it was a bit disconcerting, but I did it anyway. So uh, that was my trajectory. And then, then I got interested in, in biology for a while. Collected shells and marine specimens, marine biology. I, I like chemistry a lot. Physics less. Math was not fascinating, except number theory. Always fascinating me because of the simplicity. Uh, what else? Uh, and, and then I went to went up to Cambridge to Trinity, to the invitation of Oliver Braddock and Horace Barlow, who were here at the time, and they invited me to uh, come to a Cambridge Philosophical Society scholarship. For, a month, for two months here, because I'd written some papers from India, published in Nature. They saw these papers and then they said, would you like to come and visit? I was doing a PhD and I was doing a medical school there. So then I came, came to Cambridge and they were very gracious as host, as, as, as only, only you guys can be. And then we, uh, we hit it off and they said, come and do a PhD here. So I went and do a PhD and put it not for that grant from Cambridge Philosophical Society, I would not be here today giving this talk. But a sequence of events, accidents, I might say, I'm here. So it's wonderful to be here, and I'll now go on to the main, you don't want to hear about my, we can come back to my career later if you want, but what, what, what I think about science and scientific discovery and all of, all of that stuff, the importance of anomalies, the importance of not ignoring anomalies, and what are good reasons for ignoring them, what are good, bad reasons for ignoring them. Also about, you know, again, to state the obvious, things like elegance and simplicity, which are obviously in the Cavendish, you guys know them better than anybody in the world. Whereas there's a widely widespread belief among many of my colleagues, this is a superstition, almost a superstition. The more complicated, the more uh, elaborate the data analysis, the more complicated your equipment, the more expensive the equipment, the more better the result. It was nonsense, of course, you and I know that. I mean, there's Kirk and Watson sitting in that shed, not far from here, well, far from here, but in Cambridge playing with these magnets and bits of wire and, and then discovering the most make me most important discovery in biology of the century of all time maybe so it's nothing to do with having you know having very sophisticated equipment i tell people actually stifles your originality and creativity far from improving it actually stifles it not always true but can, can happen it's a dangerous game to play yeah so i shouldn't go off on tangents like this I'll come back to the research okay so what I'm, what, I'm, what, I'm, what I'm getting to is saying that in neurology, neurology is full of these anomalies. If you come at the right time in the development of the field, you're lucky. So that's when it's the most exciting. You know, anomalies, you show it's bogus, you show it's real. What, are, what is its impact? What is its broader significance? Why am I interested in this? When you learn, learn to do science in the process of discovering anomalies, so I'm going to tell you about lots of anomalies in neurology and perception, normal perception, illusions, Illusions are much in common with brain syndrome. There's something paradoxical about them. A guy says, this is not my hand, but it's attached to my shoulder. 
Paradox is essential in, in, in neurology. And resolving, what is paradox? resolving a paradox? You, you gain new insights. In, in, uh, in, in, in magic show, same thing. Not as important, but the same idea, right? You've got some anomaly, woman being sliced. How is he comes out intact? Third, third, third thing that's similar is, uh, is um, jokes and humor. Where you, there is some sort of, you take somebody along a garden path of expectation, I mean, there's a, you build up a story and narrative, and then suddenly there's a twist. It entails a complete reinterpretation of the entire narrative, right? But then the reinterpretation, very important, should not lead to harm. It should be harmless reinterpretation. Then you start laughing. So the, the, the portly gentleman walks, walks across, you know, he slips on a banana peel and falls down, slips on a banana peel and falls down, you start laughing, giggling. But if your head cry blood starts coming up, you don't do that. You call the ambulance. Normally, there's some perverse people who <laughs> might. Normally, you'd call the ambulance. Right? So, key difference is in, in one case, wipe out the banana, there's no, no harm done. So, so you, you keep quiet. You just laugh. You tell people, your, your peers. Then there's, an, there's a false alarm. Don't worry about attending, coming to his aid. Don't waste your resources. False alarm. On the other hand, uh, if you don't laugh, you know, it's a true, true alarm, it's a different sound you make. So this, in my view, this is the origin of laughing humor. So here again, it's about anomalies, right? Something anomalous at the end, and you change the story. So there are similarities between humor and, and doing science and magic shows. I was interested in all three, and I don't think these are necessary conditions, but you often, you often see that in, 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 in scientists. Okay, so let's move on to the first anomaly. Um, I think I'll talk about phantom limbs is over publicized and widely known, but I will allude to it briefly, some new findings that made on phantom limbs. But I'll also talk about an extraordinary condition which is not much is known, but we've started working on it called apotomenophilia, apotomenophilia or xenomelia. Xenomelia, your arm is foreign. This is seen to some extent in strokes, but different syndrome. Your right parietal stroke. What happens the patient's left arm is completely paralyzed. Left, left body is completely paralyzed. Sometimes just the left arm. But the patient vehemently denies the paralysis. So you say, Mrs. D, can you move your left arm? Yes. Can you move your right arm? Yes. Show me. Right arm is fine, right? Can you touch my nose with your left hand? Yes. Yes. I'm touching. touching. I'm almost touching it. It's about a centimeter from your nose. And it's also lying lifeless on her, on, her, on her lap. Why would an intelligent person who can play chess with you, talk about anything under the sun, when it comes to her hand, say it's moving fine and it's lying lifeless? Now you can take this a step further and say, but it's not, look, it's attached to you. How can you, 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 you say you can move it. Why, why don't you show me, show me move it? Several reactions happen. When you push the patient, the question is what, what happens when you push the patient? Several reactions happen. Most commonly, nothing happens. They go silent, form of denial. We all do it, same strategy. What this patient is doing is a highly exaggerated version of what we all do in our normal lives, what Freud, especially Anna Freud, called defense mechanism. Now that's very vague, but it's on the right, point in the right direction. Why is it so amplified in these in patients? We have defense mechanism, but you wouldn't say, you know, your arm is moving with a paralyzed. That's the key question that interests me. Uh, so, but condition I'm, I'm interested in, I'm not going to talk about that condition, which is very interesting, which you got worked on, but it's complicated. Uh, but just to tell you, tell you about anomalies, right? I'm telling you about anomalies. Another example is a woman who, who not only denies that the arm is paralyzed, but denies that it belongs to her. It's even rarer, but you do see it once every, once every couple of months you see a patient. You see, so I, I saw the patient not, not long ago. I said, what, can you move your left arm? Yes. Can you move your right arm? Yes. Show me, move, move your right arm, touch my nose. Touch my nose with your left hand. Okay. Mrs. D, can you move your left hand? Yes. You know, I've been distracting her for five minutes. Mrs. D, what is this? That's my brother's hand. Where do you say it's your brother's hand? It's big and hairy. But where is your brother? Maybe he's hiding, hiding under the chair, maybe? You are her, her talking, right? Yeah. Intelligent woman, that's what she says. 
Let it go. Let talk for chit chat for another two minutes. Can you show me again? Can you move your right hand? Can you touch my nose with your left hand? Touch my nose with your left hand. I'm telling you that, right? You know what she does? That means somebody in there knows that her left hand is paralyzed. Somebody in, uh, in there knows that that's, that, that, that in fact is her hand, not somebody else's hand. So when you ask her explicitly, she gives you a different story. This is true of all of us in our daily lives, by the way. It's not just true of the faith. She's just comically, comical exaggeration. But here you have a laboratory for Freud. So all the discovery of the defense mechanism, why they occur, what the revolutionary role is, why did they evolve? But that's another talk. Let me move on to the, another condition, which is called apotomy failure. But a patient, a guy who's otherwise completely normal, holds a normal job, has family, career, everything is fine. But harbors a secret desire to get rid of his left arm or right arm, most often left arm. Amputated. This is pretty grotesque. Imagine somebody comes to you and tells you he wants his arm amputated. Nothing else wrong with him. Not psychotic, not, not any, no mental, mental instability. So why does this happen? And uh, we first thing we did was some routine neurological testing. We thought maybe the sensations were diminished here. The sensory pathways from the arm to the brain are diminished congenitally. And therefore, the arm feels odd and he wants to remove it. Reasonable, unlikely but reasonable theory. So what we said was, let's try that. Let's see what the sensations are like. We measure the sensations there, it's completely normal. By the way, another thing that clued is in, is patient. people used to say, there are theories about this, by the way, before we came along. The chat groups, no scientific studies, chat groups, um, and among them, there's some attempted theory why, why they have this abhorrence of the arm. So I asked the chap, I said, why do you want your arm removed? Does it feel that like it doesn't belong to you? Alienation? No, no, on the contrary, it, it, it's intruding on me constantly. It, it, it's, not, it's not as though it doesn't belong to me, it actually over belongs to me, like an unwanted child. I wanted to get rid of it. So these subtle distinctions are important as you, as you go along. What is it? More like an unwanted child, but, uh, but sticking to me. Not that I don't, not that I feel it doesn't belong to me. It over belongs to me, over belongs to me. Okay, keep that in mind. Then I said, okay, well, what, maybe what's going on is, um, let's go and record in the brain, maybe something, something there. Or maybe the this arm is disconnected, but we have to more, do more subtle testing. So what we did was GSR, galvanic skin response. What I mean by that is, if, you, if, I, if I poke you with a needle, you and put two electrodes on the skin anywhere else in the body, instantly the, the skin, skin uh, moisture, resistance changes instantly because you're trying to adjust to the pain, forthcoming action, increasing vasculature in the muscles and skin. So then you, your hand becomes cold and clammy, more, more easy for current to pass through. You can register this on, 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 on your, on your uh, galvanometer and see so that it, that the skin, change in skin resistance, SCR, skin resistance. Yeah, somebody has a question? Okay. Yeah, it's a very interesting phenomenon here, by the way. I'm raising this hand here, and I don't know what that is. The reason is because of the timing, there's a time delay. So I see a hand loosely synchronized, but not, not accurately, so my brain interprets that as somebody else's hand. So maybe that sort of thing is also happening in these patients, maybe. Anyhow, he says that I find it abhorrent. How long have you had this? I asked him. From as far back in childhood as I can remember, I've had this condition of wanting my arm removed. Again, something bizarre. And I said, and he said, I've been to all doctors, and they told me they, they will not surgically remove an, an, a normal arm. Mm -hmm. So I've come to you because you, you have a lot of connections, and I heard you're near, you live near Mexico, so maybe you can do something. <laughs> I don't want to do that, but I can try and find out what's, what's going on in your brain. Maybe that'd be helpful. Be fine. So we did the GSR on him. And ordinarily, if I poke you with a pin, messages go through the skin and to the, eventually into the autonomic nervous system and cause you to sweat. Pain, anterior cingulate, amygdala, pressure in the brain, downflow signal causing you to sweat. It can be, skin resistance can be measured. So we did that hoping that we'd find that the resistance would be lower. Sorry, the, the, the skin resistance would change less in the abnormal arm than the normal arm. Because it's disconnected from the brain, doesn't sense the, the poke, poke, pin poke, therefore he will not react as much. He took, a, he took a, a felt pen and drew a line around his elbow 
a precise line, proximal to the line. If you poke him, he gets aversion. But more importantly, he gets a galvanic skin response. It's normal. What about distal to the line? Our, our expectation was it'd be lower. In fact, it was higher. Much higher. What's going on here? If it's been disconnected from the brain, why is it, why is it higher? <laughs> Another puzzle. So then we're going to look at the brain. Then it gets interesting. You go to the brain. Okay, let's take a look. The messages from the skin go up the spinal cord, the sensory signals go up the spinal cord, and to the post central gyrus, it goes two, three, and then the strip of cortex on the side of the brain where the arm or hand or body skin is mapped onto. There are several such S1, S2, S3, somatosensory one, somatosensory two, somatosensory three. S1 is basic touch. S2 is more sophisticated proprioception you know, and texture. So it gets, information processing gets more and more sophisticated as you go along, along the pathway. So when we went to S1, S2, so we, so we found nothing in this, uh, totally in the skin of the normal when you poke it. You go to S2 and S1, again, completely normal. Sorry, S1 is completely normal. The ground surface, there's a map of the body on the surface of the brain. That map is completely normal. So we said, what are we wasting our time here? Everything is normal, right? Then we went to the superior parietal lobule. This is not that, it's in that region, roughly in that region. Superior parietal lobule, where there's a polymodal convergence of all the sensory systems. Vision, touch, proprioception, hearing, maybe um, taste, and less so, but taste and smell, okay? All of these converge, vestibular sense, sense of all of these converge to construct your body image, a vibrant sense of your body moving in space and time. When you close your eyes, you feel it, okay? That's constructed in your superior parietal lobule. That area, you can map everything, did not contain the arm. So you know what's happening? What's happening is the sensory signals are normal. They're going to the thalamus, going to the cortex. But when they arrive from the arm to that region, there's nothing but it's synapse. That region is missing, congenitally. So then, then the, the discrepancy, the brain abhors discrepancy. The signal gets sent to the amygdala and to the uh, anti uh, sorry, amygdala and, and insula, insular cortex, creating the sweating that you see in the galvanic skin response, and also creating there's a desire to avoid avoid pain and all, all of that, aversive of stimuli. So all this is taking place very, very rapidly. That's why the guy wants his arm removed. He, without, without listening to my advice, he, he nodded to everything I said, maybe that's true, went and got his arm amputated in, in, in Mexico, six months later. And I've never seen him happy, happier. First time, he, he said, doctor, for the first time, I'm glad at least you didn't stop me. He said, you really need to go, you can go. You were the first person who told me that. So when I get, got it done, I was I have mixed feelings about the whole thing. I got it done, but for the first time in my life, I'm really enjoying life. I'm, I feel like a full person. See the irony of that. I feel like a full person without the arm. If you do not have the arm. So we, we, we have the physiology of this map that we think we're on the right track. We're not 100% sure because we only done two patients. Another group has confirmed this. We're reasonably sure, but not 100% not sure. Now, that's apotomnophilia. Apotomnophilia, I told you about that. Or xenomelia is called. Another name is xenomelia. But before we came along, the standard theory you find in psychiatry textbooks is a Freudian one. At least some of it is a Freudian one. They said the guy wants an arm removed because he wants attention. This is bizarre. I mean, what would, is it, it's a drastic reason having an arm removed just for getting a little bit of attention. Why not wear a funny, funny shirt or get a bit of your nose, a bit of your ear removed? Why the arm? Then strike me as all plausible. Also, another theory was that these guys uh, are sort of, they, they want to amputate the arm because the stump resembles a giant penis. This again strikes me as absurd, but orthodox Freudians think there's something to it. So we can, advantage of this science, cognitive neuroscience is that you basically can replace this vague cognitive, vague, um, I don't want to say Freudian, but you know, theories of that kind and come up with, look at the actual neurocircuitry in the brain and do very simple experiments. This one we took one day and figured out why there's a group of people on this planet who want their arm removed. Question is, can you help them anyway? 
that we have not achieved. So the next next slide shows you that in the case of uh, the converse of this, where you have arm removed versus it's been removed, but he still, 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 still has the arm there. He thinks the arm is there. So not, not thinks, he feels the arm there. That's called the phantom limb. By the way, am I audible and easy to understand, or should I go more slowly? No, it's perfect. Perfect, perfect. Okay. All right, so um, going back, back to the phantom limb, been known for a long time, you all know about this, all stories floating around, okay? You remove an arm, basically you feel it, you feel a phantom, a presence of a phantom there. What we found was that you, you take a Q-tip, you do a new, new routine neurological exam on this patient with phantom limb, touch him in different parts of the body, and face and head and all that. Then what happens is when you touch the face, lower part of the face, okay? You touch it, you say, oh, that's my forehead. That's my cheek, that's my neck, that's my chest, that's my chest. Oh my God, that, I, I feel that in my phantom thumb. So why do you feel it in the phantom thumb? I don't know, oh, that's my phantom index finger. Phantom pinky. He took a felt pen and drew a sharpie, and drew all the fingers. He's like what's called single unit neurophysiology. You're doing plotting receptor fields. You call them receptor fields. This is fun. Same thing, what hard hard is barrel on this is called receptor fields. You discover receptor fields. So here, these are, those are physiological receptor fields. These are psychological receptor fields, obviously. Right? So you found these, and then very clearly demarcated from each other. Thumb, index finger, there's no overlap. Clearly de demarcated from each other. And stable, it doesn't matter. A month, same map emerges. And they, they, they wipe the, you take a photograph and they wipe the page afterwards. So you know they haven't, there's no reason for them to even try to keep the map, right? So we are sure it's a real phenomenon, but the referees didn't believe it. Finally, we published in science. And then we did some brain imaging, which you have to do. You don't have to, but it's good to do it. <laughs> and showed that the map in the brain had changed. How did how has it change? That's a normal map in a normal person, coronal case. Notice certain peculiarities of this Penfield map. Map by taking human subjects, undergoing surgery for epilepsy, putting electrodes in different parts of the cortex, asking them, what do you feel? Tingling. Oh, my thumb is tingling, doctor. My index finger is tingling. My pinky is tingling. It's tingling sensation is felt, and you get map out the entire body surface and the surface of the brain. So far, so good. Now, what is interesting, though, is some parts are overrepresented. Look at how the lips and the lower part of the face is, is much bigger than the entire hand. And the body. Look at how the hand alone occupies the same area as the body. No doubt, because you put your hand to, to a lot of use. Right? Okay. We think. We think. That's a plausible explanation. Now, another, another peculiarity is the fact that Anybody here in the audience can, can tell me what another peculiarity is. A map requires that two adjacent points in a map, uh, uh, adjacent points in the world are also adjacent in a map. Number one. Number two, the one to one. You kind of one point represents two points. So you've got topography. All those principles are true, except that the face is much bigger, so you get magnification. Principle of magnification. And, and another peculiarity is dislocated. The penis and genital, instead of being near the, uh, you know, in the crotch are actually below the foot. Nobody quite knows why. Um, some, some people have suggested ideas that come to later. The head should be near the neck, but it's dislocated below the hand, correct? Another funny thing is the head is up right side up. Everything else is upside down, head is right side up. Why is that? You're anomalies, right? All of these are anomalies. <laughs> The whole phenomenon is an anomaly, anomaly, phantom limbs, but within the anomaly, there's sub anomalies. Right? So, I was like, homing in on the sub anomaly, why does this happen? Then, when I went and looked at the Penfield famous map, the Penfield map has become iconic of neuro neurology and neuroscience, this map, right? Yeah. We went and looked at, I went and looked at original data, very, very difficult to get the original data, but this is pre computer age. You had to get an antique book, look through it, antique monograph, and then we found that there's a couple of each each point, one 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 subject is one point or two points, averaging over ten subjects. So very poor statistics. So thought, but not to not to belittle his discovery, very important discovery, obviously, that is a map of the body and the surface of the brain. But I said maybe he got this oriented in the head wrong. It's very few points. So maybe Penfield got the head wrong, upside down. So I said let's go to a normal person, and then repeat this with more careful measurements, just for fun. We're giving a lecture at Stanford, and 
Engel, Dr. Engel, listen to me, Steve Engel. We are in fact this week we are recording from S1, S2, and we are mapping the Penfield, sorry, mapping the Penfield map using uh, brain imaging. We'll tell you what we find. Who do you want to collaborate with? I don't want to collaborate with you. Here, 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 just do it. Yeah. So then a week later, he phoned me and he said, My God, you're right. The head should be the other way around. Great. Now, <laughs> who cares? Doesn't matter if I some quirk in the middle of the map, maybe. I especially like this experiment because it's the first, first time somebody can come with a Q tip and spend half an hour on the face. And disprove 50 years of neurology. I think all those diagrams should be replaced. <laughs> every every medical school student reads about his head being upside down. So I felt I had the sadistic thrill of doing this. That's the only reason. There's no theoretical importance. But I thought I'd just mention it. Okay, now what, what else can you do? Okay, what about how long does it take? Patients we saw initially two weeks, one week, two days, the reorganization of the pathways in a matter of two or three days. And what's going on here? When you amputate the arm, very important. Why does this happen? It touches face, he feels it in the hand. Why? When you amputate the arm, there are no signals coming into the arm area, the cortex, the hand area, right? That area is devoid of signals and it's asking for signals, so to speak. So the sensory input from the face skin normally goes and activates the face area of the brain, invades the vacated territory corresponding to the missing hand. Is that clear? Face skin comes to face area normally, now invades the vacated territory corresponding to the missing hand from face. Then they can invade it and start activating those cells. To me, that's interesting in itself that it invades and activates. But it forms receptive fields too. It's not, it's not higgledy piggledy. It forms receptive fields, forms topography. And now you can take a drop of hot water, put it on his face. Oh my God, my phantom is warm and it feels good. Okay. I took a piece of ice, you know what I'm saying? And then what it feels cold, man. Phantom is cold after about 10 seconds, not immediately 10 seconds. Then, then one can say, Oh my God, I said, What? The water is dribbling down my phantom. I know you're putting it on my face, it's dribbling down my phantom. It's like this. You follow, trace the pathway of the dribble. And just out of a perverse curiosity, I said, Raise your stump to the ceiling. I'm going to do it again. Water started dribbling. And he said, Oh my God, it's going up, defying the laws of gravity. It's going up, up the arm, up the phantom. Of course, there's no reason it shouldn't, but it's still very interesting to watch these phenomena, showing that the reorganization of sensory passes in the brain is not chaotic, modality specific. Want input goes to the warm area, cold to the cold area, and just touch to touch. Take a vibrator, put it on the face, and my, my phantom is vibrating. So all of this happening in a matter of days or weeks, which is contradicts this dogma in neurology, at the time when I discovered it 15 years ago. That no new connections can be formed in the adult brain. Connections are laid in the fetus or in, or in the very young infant. Once they are laid down, that's it. If there's damage, there's no recovery function. That explains why neurology is a gloomy profession by and large. But we're saying that's bullshit. You can change over two centimeters in a matter of hours. But all the fully formed receptive field, all that takes about a week. You can do neuroembryology with a Q-tip. Now, Another point I want to make is, what about the foot? I think I'll jump ahead. We're going to come back to that in the discussion, because I don't want to miss synesthesia, okay? But you can ask me later, what if the foot is amputated? It's very interesting. Uh, but I will say the trigeminal nerve is cut. Face becomes a numb and anesthetized. And people in Lausanne, Peter Clark has shown, if you now touch the hand, it doesn't feel sensation in his face, in his anesthetized face. So you, you anesthetized face there's no input coming to the face. It's dumb, it's numb. Input coming from the hand skin invades the vacated position in the face, opposite, from, from above, and starts activating. Therefore, from, if you put Q-tip on his hand, you get a map of the face on the hand. Number of examples like that. If you, if you cut the, oh, by the way, there's, there's also a second map. I won't go into that now. Oh, yeah, now this is gets very interesting. I thought I was done with phantom limbs, and then I, then I came across a paper by Rudgelati, Giacomo Rudgelati. Wonderful paper on mirror neurons, which you've all heard about. For those of you who have not, you record, I told you about the neurons in the monkey, or, or people, and you record from S1. There's a map of the body surface, 
surface, surface, surface of the body on the surface of the brain. Correct? Similarly, there are neurons which are proprioceptors. That if you perform an action, motor cortex sends signals out, orchestrates a sequence of twitches of muscles, twitches of muscles, to, for you to pick up a peanut. Cascade of events that you to the peanut. Now, what Zunzalani found was some, 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 in, in some monkeys, sorry, in some neurons, but 10%, not a small number, 10% of these so called motor neurons are actually responding. Even if the monkey doesn't be he's just watching another monkey reach for the peanut, the stuff's firing. You know, mumbo jumbo telepathy, if you close your eyes, it doesn't happen. Right? So if the monkey is watching the other monkey, it, 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 it sort of performs a virtual reality simulation of what's going on. When, it, I mean, when the same neurons fire in its brain, it says, that monkey is feeling the same thing as I would feel if I were to reach out to the banana. Therefore, he's reaching out to the banana. So the monkey, he's about, even if the monkey is about to reach the banana, but the person is about to reach the mirror neuron starts firing, anticipating his taking the banana and putting it in the mouth. And for many, many actions, they found these mirror neurons. He hailed it as a great discovery. I endorsed it. That is amazing. Discovery. Now, of course, it's still, I still think it's an amazing discovery. I don't know why people really become polarized by this discovery. Either they say it's bullshit or they say it's amazing to get a Nobel Prize. So we will wait and see. That's why I didn't want to get into it. It's too controversial a topic. Okay, now, okay, here's a question. This motor, sens motor mirror neuron, but also sensory mirror neuron, Christian Kaiser. Sensory mirror neurons are the ones behind the sensory surface, where the sensory map is, the Penfield map, a little further back. Um, okay, yeah, I, I want to see brain slide. Uh, you want to move the slides, or yeah, I was going to go to the brain, I have a generic brain slide. Okay, uh, I, I yeah. can only see the title slide now. Oh, you're not been seeing all the slides. Yeah, yeah, only the title. That's bizarre. I, ho I was hoping you could see the slide. I'm sorry about that. Why is it you can't see the slide? Uh, I don't know. I can only see, I, I see the title, the first slide, the title slide. Mm -hmm. I told you about 10, 10 different slides. So that means none of this would have made any sense. I can see embodied brains and disembodied minds, the title slide. Okay, well, I don't know what happened. We need to fix that. We need to fix that before we can. You don't see, I'm changing, changing the slides right now. Uh, you don't see any of those changes. Well, I have to call my, my <laughs> TA. Uh, maybe Maurice can help. Uh, Is Maurice here? Yeah? Maybe I fine. can see a different uh, slide than you can see. I, I, I don't understand exactly. But I yeah, only. I, I saw 10 different slides, 10 different. Oh, okay, I only see the title slide. We well, have to fix that. We have to fix that. So it might be that you're using uh, uh, essentially a screen extension. So you have one uh, image that is projected on your laptop or on your, on your PC screen, and one image that is projected remotely. And hence, it might be that you moved across the slides in your PC, but we still have the, the same uh, projected slide. So maybe. You want to try and press S or something like that on your PowerPoint I'm and see whether we get the same image. But what should I do again? <laughs> it's, I mean, it's just a possibility, right? Yes. So there is an, an option in PowerPoint that is extended screen where you can have oh. one image that is displayed on your screen and a different yeah. image that, that is displayed remotely, right? So it might be that you were moving across the slides on your screen and we still we were still left with a with a cover slide, right? So if you want to try to address that, you can press ESC, ESC, right? The escape, right? Uh, the key on the top left. And that usually gets rid of the extended mode. Is uh, Maurice here? Uh, I, think, I think he's gone, but he can he can work from wherever he is. Uh, maybe he can help. Maurice? Uh, I don't think he's there. Uh, Just insane. Uh, Maurice. I'm trying to think of any other way to do it. How about if I put a mirror? <laughs> if, I, 
You put on my screen, would you see it? I wonder. The creative solution. Let me, let me. Uh, it worked before when we tested it, it worked. I know, I know what happened. So, it worked before, in, but now, uh, wait a second. What about resume share? Does that help? Stop share, resume share. New share. Is is Maurice here? I sent him an email. Is he yeah. you, Maurice? I have is, a phone, but probably he's the one. Maybe he can help you. Mm -hmm. then, another thing you can try doing is stop sharing the slides. And then start sharing again. Stop sharing the slides. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm not sure exactly what you have on your screen, right? But usually there is, uh, right, a banner of options or buttons at the bottom of the screen, uh, and you can select to share the screen or stop sharing. So you might want to try stop sharing and then start sharing again. Okay, and then we can see whether the slides match on our okay. side and your side, right? Is that enough to start, start sharing? Uh, I, I think so. So, I mean, I have it on my on my side. I have a button that is share screen, but I'm not sharing at the moment, right? So if you are sharing and you're sharing the cover slide at the moment, you probably first need to stop sharing. Okay, and then- not, It now tells me your, 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 your screen Sharing is, is paused. Stop sharing is in red. Should I stop sharing? You said should I stop sharing, right? Yes, sharing. I mean, apparently the screen on our side is frozen. So exactly, now you stopped sharing because yes. we don't see anything anymore. And then yes. you can try starting sharing again. So okay. share screen, and we can okay. check whether we see the same slides on, on your side and on our side, right? This is the one we just had. Ah, now. Yes. Yes. Perfect. 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 Okay. What What can you see there? Uh, a face with a brain on the top. Uh, it's, so it's, it's. Yeah. Slide two of 63. We also so see I, the I, slide I, number I, at the bottom. It says slide two of, 60, of 63, right? Slide I number can't, two. I can't see the slide, so I don't know. I, 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 can I remove this? Uh, there's a panel here to zoom back to meeting. Uh, we can you... see the slide number two now. Uh, and we see your whole desktop here. Right. The problem is I see only a white, white, white. I see you've got three faces. On the screen, I only see a white screen with back, four buttons. Oh. Schedule, back. I don't I... know, I just move it away. Maybe we move it away. Yeah, I'm able to move it away. Okay. Well, okay, now, now what happens? No, okay, okay that's the, the brain in the slide, right? Slide the brain, is that what you think? Yes, we can see the yes. brain from the, from the top. Right, from of. the top, illuminated, colored, colored, illuminated. It's color, colorful. Yes, that's right. Blue yes. and uh, red and white and uh, orange or yellow. We yeah. can see the different parts of the brain in different colors. Okay, that's, that's correct. That's working. I'm going to be careful yeah. not to lose it. And then from here, you can probably just uh, right, use the arrows at the bottom to move across the slides, and we will likely see all the different slides because we see the full PowerPoint okay. window, right? Okay, let me do that. Let me see if I, I hope nothing happens. Oop. Uh, the, the, the button doesn't, doesn't change the slide. Maybe there's another button a second. <clears throat> well, I mean, I. I think you're controlling the black arrow over there, right? On the left. A black arrow on the left? I mean, the, oh, I the mouse oh, arrow. On, 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 the, on the mouse pad? Yes, oh, yes, exactly. Okay, on the launch pad. So, 
So if you move that to, to, the, to the arrows at the bottom of the PowerPoint window, right next to slide two of 63, there's an arrow on the left and an arrow on the right. If you press on those arrows, I think it, it would probably Right, I'm trying to find the arrows. I've got, I've got the arrows on the keyboard, but I don't have any arrows on the screen. Oh, okay. You know, uh, so on, on your PC, you're not you're you're actually not seeing the PowerPoint window on your PC. Is that right? I, I'm seeing my my slide with the brain. And I'm seeing your four four of our faces here. People talking. Oh. Okay, great. So if you're seeing the slide with the brain, then under the brain and under the face, yeah. you see there's the label slide two of 63, right? I'm looking for that. Slide two of... Yeah, it's... Slide two of 63, yes. Yes, yes slide exactly. Yes. Yeah. And there are small white arrows next to it, right? Correct. One, one point to the left, one point to the right. Exactly. So if you if you click on them, you can just I mean I'm assuming that if you click on them, it's going to turn the slides and move to slide three and slide four and so on, right? Yes, probably. <laughs> okay. Um, the, well, not the, not not the, not the stocks, probably. Yeah, but slightly above that, yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'll do it carefully, but it's working. Great. So you can move across the, the whole presentation like that. I'm going backwards here. Okay, that's right. So that's, that's, that's the first slide. I'm just going to touch, touch on the briefly show you the slides as I said, so that you didn't miss the argument. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay Perfect. Perfect. Okay, just briefly to remind you that strip of cortex on the left visual, there's a left visual cortex. There, I can't use my hands. You can see the left frontal lobe, left temporal lobe, the occipital lobe, and in the middle of the brain, there's a brown strip going down. That yeah. brown strip is the oh my left, it's somatosensory cortex one, which I told you about. And that, if you in front of it, is a gyrus, is a motor cortex. You don't want to worry about that now. One is somatosensory cortex one, S1, which is where Penfield mapped the brain, and I showed you that map, right? So I'm going to move further forward. Here, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, the one to the right. Yeah. Probably right next to things is stocks. Yeah, I mean, I, you can just press there because under it you have that small icon that's a stock market app or something like that. But as long as you stay on the arrow in the PowerPoint, it moves the slides. Yeah, exactly. That's the map on the face I was telling you about. From the Q tip. Mm -hmm. What do we say? We're talking about upper terminal media, that is the same map, the, all the areas are present accurately. Only when you go higher up to the polymodal superior temporal gyrus, then you lose the face area. So there's a discrepancy. The, the brain says, I don't like this, it's a burn. So you have the arm removed. It seems strange to us, but to his brain, that's what makes sense. And then after that, I'm glad we discovered that. I'm sorry, you guys had to. There's a map again. I don't know why it's showing it again. Oops. <laughs> How did that happen? Uh, you have to go to the right, uh, uh, to this red signal uh, in the upper left hand side. Then you will close this window. Go to the upper left hand side. Yeah, go to the right point. There's if you go to the yeah, if you go further up, there's a red point. You click on yeah. the red point, then you close it. Here you click oh, on close it. Mm -hmm. yeah, close it. Okay, then, good. Yeah. Okay, so so then you see the maps on the face, but I'm gonna go to the next slide. I tried that, but that's the wrong thing. And try again. And oh, you yeah, have to go point. to the little triangle. This uh yeah. little what I'm doing. Yeah, you need to stay on the arrow and not click on the icon below it. Yeah, you just need. Yeah. 
over there. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's slightly above it. Yeah, I mean, you need to stay on the air. Yeah, that's right. Okay, I got tremor, so it's hard to do that. I'll try. Okay, now this is map. Then I said maybe so the street. Is, that's what I was, I was talking about upside down space, right? We don't need that anymore. Yeah. We took the same patients and did brain mapping. I won't go into that. Confirms our theory. There has been massive reorganization of sensitive, massive reorganization of sensitive pathways in the adult brain. That's challenging all the dogma in brain. Okay. I wish somebody would remove that box. <laughs> yeah, you have to move yeah, a little bit up. It's this arrow is very small. It's hard. Yeah, I'm not sure whether you can maybe move the whole tab with the apps uh, um, further down so that it doesn't disturb you but but otherwise you need to pay attention because it's it's very packed you're talking about genomelia oh, really yeah that's okay, you're back to genetics right mm -hmm. so we're going to say mirror neurons you're talking about mirror neurons there's the sensory mirror neurons which are seen in s2 these neurons respond if i touch you they fire they touch you mm -hmm. they poke you with a needle they fire but the same neurons, 10% of them, will fire if I poke you with a needle. And my neurons are firing. Somebody watch, I'll watch your neurons being poked or your head being poked. This is the same like telepathy, but again, it's not taking visual image of you and transforming it into internal virtual reality simulation, mapping your body onto mine and then saying, you are about to feel the same thing I would feel if somebody were to poke my forehead, poke my jaw. See what I'm getting at? So these neurons are responding not only to it, only to you being poked on your left hand, but you're watching me being poked. They're called monkey see, monkey do neurons, or mirror neurons. This is a vast story that which I won't go into, but I started wondering if it's really true that when your friend is being poked, you, your neurons, your, your pain neurons fire, the anterior cingulate and the, the insula. How come you don't say, ouch, you throw your hand every time you see somebody? You empathize, but you don't shout out and pull, pull your hand out. You don't feel the pain. You empathize. How do you know what to do? The answer is, I think, the signal is coming from the in your intact hand, informing you you're not being poked. You're watching somebody being poked, so you empathize. But your hand is saying, but don't worry, you're not being poked. So you damp those signals just adequately. Mirror neurons can act and say, feel empathy. You know, you know what he's going through, but don't actually feel pain. That would be stupid. That would be silly. Otherwise, every time you feel felt hungry. You watch somebody eat, then you'd be happy. You, your race would soon die out. Right? So that doesn't happen. Okay. So then I said, if this is true, but first of all, is it true? How do you test it? How do you test the simple idea that when, when somebody's arm is poked, the only reason you don't you don't feel sensation is because you have a skin, maybe normal. You remove your skin and look at somebody being poked. You should feel it in your in your eye, in your hand. His poke in your hand. That seemed absurd, but we tried it on two patients. And both of them, when I said, I'm going to touch different parts of my body. I want to tell, tell me, I didn't tell anybody pain. I just said, I'm going to touch different parts of your body. Tell me what you feel. It's a choice though. I don't feel anything. No, the other part has not been amputated. Actually. I don't feel anything. Oh, yeah, I, I feel, I, I feel, I feel my, my phantom. My phantom, you know, even though you're touching yourself, I feel my phantom being touched now. That too, yeah, that too, yeah, that's, that's very salient. Similarly, if you take a Q-tip, we did this just for, sciences can be a lot of fun too. We just took, I just went near the, near my, I went, okay. I went, went to a third person sitting there. You're the subject, your arm has been removed, right up to the shoulder. I go to a third person, and then I tickle the third person under his arm. What happens to you? You start giggling uncontrollably. Uncontrollably. When I stop, you stop. You can't you can't giggle, you can't tickle yourself, by the way. Well known phenomenon because you reaffirm. You know you're doing it, you know an expert. You know mismatch, so you don't you don't giggle. But if I if he does it, you don't have any even such a signal to compare it with. You start giggling. So you can transfer laughter and giggling from one human being to another human being by removing the skin. That's the, that's the astonishing. There's no practical value, but it's astonishing. In practical terms, it's very useful because we said what would happen if instead of 
it's massage the face. Then he gets a phantom massage and, it's, and, 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 and part of his face is damaged and he apparently. Similarly, if you have, he has a phantom hand that's painful, you massage your hand while he's watching. He gets a phantom massage. He's been, he's been, he's, he reported this in two patients, he's been followed up in Walter Reed, dozens of patients, about two, in general, two thirds of the patients respond positively. And among them, about half, in a dramatic way, they're actually cured almost. When you think of thousands of patients undergoing amputation, oh well, yeah, I'm jumping ahead of myself here. Another device we use called the mirror box, I can show you the mirror box, and then we're gonna move on to synesthesia. Oh, I can't do this anymore. How do I, let me go to that. So the patient comes with a phantom arm. Sometimes they say the phantom arm is fixed in a particular position. Right? Phantom arm is paralyzed, doctor. So what do you mean phantom arm is paralyzed? How can a phantom be paralyzed? And when I try to move it, it doesn't move. Every morning I get up, I start, moving, I start sweating and it's painful. Then I looked at the charts and I found all these patients who could not move their phantom limb, compared to ones who could, ones who could not move their phantom limb, had a pre-existing nerve lesion. The nerve that goes from the hand to the spinal cord, sensory nerve, had been cut by some accident, a motorcycle accident. Arm was lying lifeless in a sling, paralyzed, amputated the arm, phantom appears, the phantom is equally paralyzed. Then the oxymoronic state of phantom being paralyzed. Then I said, why is it paralyzed? Every time he sends a signal to the arm to move, paralyzed arm, no, it won't move. No, no, move, no. The heavy and link formed between the command to move the arm and the feedback saying it doesn't move. It just gets wired into the brain. You just, just give up. It's called it learned paralysis. Very, very far-fetched idea. I said, what if you then put a mirror? No, sorry. What if you give the patient feedback saying the arm is moving after all, come, according to your command. Take the brain signal, do some virtual reality, feed it back in. Christoph cost one, two million, cost $2 million to do that. Then we hit on the way of doing it for five bucks, five dollars. What do you do? You get a cardboard box, remove everything except put a mirror in the middle. He puts his right hand on the right side of the mirror, inside right side of the mirror, see the reflection. Left hand is a phantom. And guess what you see? He sees, if you look from the right, he sees a reflection of his right hand in the mirror superimposed on the felt position of the phantom left hand, as though you've resurrected the phantom. He now sends commands to both hands, hands symmetrically, clap, wave, whatever. Then you find that the patient actually sees his phantom arm for the first time in his life actually moving in response to command. The loop is closed. There's no discrepancy anymore. When you do, when you do that, he says, oh my God. Oh my God, says, my hand is moving again. My phantom is moving. Close your eyes. The piece to budge. You're trying to make it move. I'm trying to make it move, but it won't budge, Doc. Okay, open your eyes. Oh my God, it's moving. I mean, it not only looks like it's moving, it feels like it's moving. I said, well, does it bother you? Suppose my idea about crucial role of visual feedback in maintaining the phantom. Does it bother you? He says, no, on the contrary, I, 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 pain is gone. But when I open my, when I remove the mirror, pain comes back. And I said, why don't we try this for a, for a few weeks? Go home every every day, try for an hour, and after a week, report back to me. So he, he calls me back after a, a week, and I said, what's going on? He said, nothing happens. And I look at the mirror, the hand moves, it feels good. I close my eyes, it's rock solid, it refuses me, the pain comes back. C'est la vie, but try it anymore, a little bit more. He took it home, after a week, he phoned me up, and he said, wow, you're not going to believe this. Dr. Ramachandra, you're not going to believe what, 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 Calm down, it's gone. I said, what's gone? I thought maybe the box is gone. I said, no, no, not the box. What happened to my pain is gone. I said, what do you mean? Well, you remember the pain I had in my phantom? Yes. Every time I move my hand, it moved, yes. Now the phantom arm is gone the last three days. And I, I got worried and I said, well, does this bother you? And I've changed the body image of a human being. You're worried about human subjects' approval of the university. He said, no, on the contrary, because I don't have an arm, phantom arm, I don't have phantom pain, because you cannot have disembodied pain. So it feels very good. But the trouble is, the tips of the fingers in the hand are still dangling from my shoulder. The entire arm is gone, but the finger is dangling from the shoulder. That still feels painful. Can you adjust your mirror with the right height? So you can also get rid of my fingers. He thought I was a magician. And that was about five years ago. The fingers are still here, unfortunately. 
the Phantom Arm is gone after being with him for eight years. It was made up five, five, five minutes, it went away. It made up for two weeks, long term dose, went away completely. So we have not done this in all the readers, dozens of the patients. One third of patients with chronic acute or chronic phantom pain benefit from it. Without it, 10% of the placebo recovery. So 20% is genuine. And it's, it's a lot considering pain research. It, 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 normal treatment for phantom pain is either cut the spinal cord, which is invasive, or give them oxycontin or some deadly drug, poisonous drug, opiates. There are all kinds of side effects, as you know, and even mortality. And it costs a fortune. And at least in the mirror, there are no side effects from the mirror. And there's no mortality, mortality for sure. So even though the success rate is only 30%, we're very happy with used to, in clinics throughout the world, including UK. Now I want to move on to another phenomenon concerning phantom limb, and then we're going to move on to synesthesia. We're running out of time. Uh, the other point about synesthesia I wanted to make is that I told you about the mirror effect, right? massage thing. Can you have phantom pain or illusory pain in an intact arm? So what does that mean? But when I break you, break your uh, one of the on your uh, metacarpal bones, a small hairline fracture. It's painful. It swells. You get signs of inflammation. Classic signs of inflammation. It swells, becomes red, painful, immobilized. So reflex immobilization. This happens to protect your finger from further damage. You don't want to go around playing with it because it will cause more damage. It's to allow the finger to re recover. Nature has given it a pain signal. If you move it, it's painful. So you stop moving it. Normally, when the, when the bone heals after two weeks, the inflammation goes away, redness goes away, pain goes away, swelling goes away, and starts moving the finger again. Now, this is not rare. One in 50 people get this. Excruciatingly painful. Unfortunately, the pain spreads from the finger to the hand. The entire hand is swollen. The entire arm is swollen. And your lifestyle, life, life, your lifestyle is severely compromised. Some of them do indeed come, 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 contemplate suicide. So we said, well, can you can solve this with a mirror? So you give them what happens now is he has a mirror phobia, he has phobia for moving the arm. Anytime it moves, he says, ah, it's painful. It becomes worse and worse and worse. So he gives up. So you put a mirror there, he moves his other hand with impunity, and it looks like phantom is moving without causing any pain. Can you unlearn the learn paralogy. These are actually very half-baked ideas, you realize. I mean, they're very far out. Nobody who thinks normally would arrive at such a conclusion. But I like Darwin's statement, that Charles Darwin's statement, that I like the fool's experiments, because they're the best ones. It's jokes. His best experiments start with jokes. Because seeing unusual juxtapositions of ideas, often the creative process is the same whether in humor or in science. Not everybody practices it, but Darwin did and I did. <laughs> okay, so, so, so then, then we said, um, where was I? Oh, yeah. R, it's called RSV, reflex into the discipline. Long, complicated name. And they hold conferences in the Caribbean and Hawaii to determine the taxonomy of RSV. They've been doing this for, for 50 years now. Is there any, any sign of progress? This is a problem with medical conferences. You know. Anyhow, we said, what, what do we give the What is it not going to cost us anything? Let's try it. But before we could get to it, Oxford got to it. Peter Halligan. And uh, Marshall, John Marshall, pain expert at, at Oxford said, what's Rama talking about? <laughs> you, know, you, 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 you sort of look at it in, in the mirror and the pain goes So they had two, two patients, three, four, four patients with RSD, put in the mirror there, have them try the procedure in, in I'm sorry, not for 21 patients. In, I'm confusing two different groups, so you need to check this, but let's say 15 patients, five patients recovered completely, five patients with partial recovery, Five patients, no, nothing at all. Compared to placebo, there was zero recovery in all patients, or maybe one, one or two, one or two percent recovery in all, all patients. This is about as good as it gets in, in neurology, pain recovery. Compared with, with Prozac or something, the efficacy is like seventy percent. And here it doesn't cost you anything. So now that's also being adopted throughout the world for RSD. Okay, so this, this is very interesting. Now, even more interesting is an observation made by Marshall and Halligan. As you watch the hand, it becomes pale. Redness goes away. Movements come back. The pain goes away. The swelling goes away. I, I, I don't believe in mind-body. I am used to not believe in a medical student. I thought, well, mumbo-jumbo, crystal healing, mind-body, medicine, all that. 
just lop off the arm or give him antibiotics or whatever. In fact, this convinced me for the first time is reality. You're giving him five minutes of the mirror, the skin temperature change. You can't fake temperature, skin temperature change, sweating changes. Showing you striking interactions between brain and, and skin. So to summarize all this, so what I said, so before I move on to synesthesia, summarize all this. The old view of the brain function is that you've got modules, special, highly specialized modules for different functions. The truth, the truth is true, not, I'm not making fun of this, it's partly true. You specialize for face recognition, for example, to recognizing faces, or color, or motion. There are modules, they do exist. So what I'm arguing is that the standard view that you compute something in modules, early modules, then send it up, up higher up, and then send it back to the, that compute something else, maybe it makes it explicit, sends it back to bias subsequent processing. This chain of re chain reaction continues. This serial hierarchical bucket brigade of autonomous module activation continues into the brain. As many signals coming back as going into the brain. I, I, it was a pretty zany idea at that time when I published it about 30, 25 years ago. But people have picked it up now and, and are starting to talk about it. It's also an obvious idea. It reduces the problem space of perception. <coughs> of perception. Otherwise, it's enormously under constraint. That could be a million different images, but my home, my brain homes it instantly on the correct image. Only the way you can, you can do that is by something like what I said earlier. Now, um, so messages go not only from the skin to the brain, but come back from the brain to the skin. Secondly, you get intersensory effects. Even touch and vision are not separate. They're inter interacting profoundly. Pain is being modulated by touch and proprioception. Who would have thought? And then what else can you think of? What about um, more than, I didn't, I didn't talk about that, but maybe I'll talk about it during, during, during uh, discussion. Your brain interacts with other brains. Forget about body and skin and all that. Through mirror neurons, the only thing separating is the skin. You remove that, you start his feeling, his feeling. So emphasizing, with his hyper empathy, we call it. Also been studied by Sarah Blakemore and by uh, what, Jamie Ward and others. So it's a new era of, of neuroscience, in my view, with all these dramatic changes. It's clinically useful, but my heart is not in the clinic. If it's incidentally useful, it's good. If you're interested in basic neuroscience, how the brain works. And one thing is clear, it's a dynamic mosaic of activation, not the static maps, the connections you learn about in textbooks. Let's move on to part two, which is on synesthesia. How are we doing for time? Do you have 30 minutes? Uh, 20 minutes. How, how do you? Yeah. Yeah. yeah? Okay. You always stop me anytime. Uh, anytime. We have all the time you, you like. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I wanted to hear. Okay, good. Uh, uh, let me just... uh, so, Greg Winter, he took about two and a half hours. So, we have any time you like. I'm sorry. I've been going on for two and a half hours? No. Yes, we can see. I'm saying, have you, have you, have you already gone on for two and a half hours? No. Uh, you we already, can... You've gone on for about an hour, right? Uh, yeah. Anytime you like. It's, okay. it's no problem at all. <laughs> I, I might just disconnect at some point because I'm connected from Europe, but otherwise, uh, I mean, it's very interesting. So, thank you. Great. Sure, sure. Okay, now I'm going to go on to. Um, well, this, by the way, phantom limb pain, just some quantitative data you can go and read the journal article. I'm not going to explain it. Decrease, decrease in the, the covered mirror is a placebo. Mm -hmm. the pain goes up, actually. Mirror goes down, not, not quite monotonic, but it goes way down, makes it more making life more bearable. I'm going to go on to the next section, which is about synesthesia. No. Okay, that's an example of RSD, where I told you about the swelling of the arm. The bones get swollen too, not just, the, we're talking about mind body, the mirror changing the bones, you know. Yeah. So the leg, foot, again, RSD pain with mirrors. It's about different kinds of therapy. 
Bit of neurons. Stop keep, stop keep intruding himself. Phantom massage. <laughs> oh boy. Yeah, shouldn't be fine now. Yeah. Okay. No, I'm not going to talk about the body. Okay. I wanted to tell you about pseudo syndromes, but we'll do that during discussions. Okay. Just remind me. Synesthesia is not a pseudo syndrome, it's a perfectly valid phenomenon. It has been known for, from the time of Galton or earlier, Charles Darwin's first cousin. And he noticed that certain people who are otherwise normal would see numbers as colored or letters as colored. So five is red, six is blue, seven is chartreuse, eight is indigo, often idi idiosyncratic colors, not necessarily common ones. And they persist over time. You bring the same guy later, Simon Baron Cohen, by the way, is the first person to show that. You bring, bring a person after a few weeks, test them again, with exquisite precision, you pick the same color, same hue from the color, color wheel. So very likely that this person is not just trying to con you, but it will still be, goes home and memorizes it, you don't know. But then we, we decided to study this phenomenon because I, I became very curious, I'm always curious about anomalies. What's going on in the brain when you, when you have synesthesia? First thing we needed to choose is that it's real, but a lot of people claim it's not even real. Sometimes schizophrenics have synesthesia, so people said that this is a manifestation of schizophrenia. That only makes it more mysterious, doesn't, doesn't solve the problem. And uh, so there are many theories floating around about synesthesia. First, they're making it up, so drawing attention to themselves. Why in this peculiar form? Seeing colored numbers, that doesn't work for me, but you have to keep it in mind. Another possibility is that these people are uh, on drugs, acid and pot and psilocybin and all that. So that sort of makes partial sense because it's much more common in Berkeley than, than where I am at UCSD. Berkeley is notorious for drug usage. There's not definitive proof, but certainly, Drug usage does contribute to synesthesia. But that doesn't mean it causes it. Many people who never use drugs, majority of people who never use drugs have synesthesia. And majority of people who use drugs don't have synesthesia. So there's no direct you know, coupling between the two. So any other evidence that it's real, they're not making it up. You needed the, the actual, actual critical test. These are all tangential lines of evidence. You needed critical test. We invented such a test, which is simply to use Yeah. Sorry, about, yeah. Mm -hmm. Segregation and pop out. Let's see that. Pretty, so this young lady came to, me, came to me after class and she said, I'm one of them. Said, what do you mean? She said, I, I, I see colors and I see numbers. And I, in the class, I just presented the finding. I didn't say, because I, I had not started working on it yet. It was 10 years ago. Then she said, I said I, then I produced this display along with my student, Ed Hubbard. Number of fives printed there, scattered among them are number of twos. Now you and I can't find them. It's very difficult to find the twos. But he sees the fives red and twos green, or vice versa. And guess what he sees? Oh, I see an upside down red triangle. I mean, it's a forest of green trees. He does it at three times the speed as you and I. You and I have to do it by scrutiny. Hey, yeah, that's, that's two. That's fine. Two, that's fine. And then construct it in your mind. He sees it effortlessly and three times the speed, which means he, and he says, what he tells you, I see it. I don't think about it, I see it. Just like I see any green grass. Tells you it's a real phenomenon. So it's the first clinical test for synesthesia. You can think of it like that, a very simple test. Then we found, unfortunately, it's not true of all of them. Only a third of them, or only about, no, sorry, only 20% of them show this pop out segregation test. Many of them just say, well, what do you mean do I see it? Of course I don't see it. I, you know, it, it looks black. But I, it, I have the irresistible urge to see it as red. But it makes me think of red. I don't literally see it. So there are two types of synesthesia. The projectors, I actually see it, and the uh, associators, who have an irresistible urge to see it, which is think of it. So first I thought I'd study the associators because they seem interesting. So I caught hold of them and I said, when you, when you say you see red, when you say five, but you say you don't actually see it, what do you mean? Is it like Cinderella? When you think of Cinderella, you think of a pumpkin? You think immediately you think of a chariot, immediately you think of mice, is it like that? No, 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 of course not. That's just that's, that's memory. Actually, I, I do see it, but I'm not in the manner you're saying, like I said, you painted on it. 
I can tell the difference, but I do see it much more intense than Cinderella. Of course, it's important if you're a physician or if you're, or if you're a scientist to make observations before you do experiments, especially in neurology, talk to the patient first. 90% of the time, he will give you the diagnosis. Then you can make it more formal and publish it, but 90% of the time, he's telling you what's, what's going on. Okay? All right, well, how do you prove this? This experiment proves without any doubt, people are seeing, seeing the colors. Next, next thing we want to do is explore it further. What is its relationship? Where is it in the brain? Well, first of all, you can do some interesting experiments with it. Some of them will say, you ask, where is the color? Obvious question. How long have you had this phenomenon? Since childhood, doctor. Since ever since as far back as I can remember, A was blue, F was green, T was red. It's always been like that. I've never seen somebody who says anything else. Always like that. Or you ask them, um, do you literally see, do you, do you see it confined to the boundary of the letter? Does it spill out? What happens? Sometimes it's confined to the boundary, but some other, other, page, other subjects, it spills out like neon color spreading, the neon light. It's a constant description. So I said, okay, let's have some fun. Yeah. What happens if you put an amoeba like line around? No, it's obvious. It's blocked by the line. It just stops spreading. It's obvious to him. It's not obvious to me. Interestingly, the line detectors, the human reason line detectors in area, 17, area 18. I'll get to that in a minute. Now, what, what if you do something, a little twist on this? Where do you do that? Uh, you go a little bit to the right to this. Uh, yeah, that's correct. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Now I want to go to the next. Yeah. Okay. Could you lose any contours? If you just four black ears, Mickey Mouse ears, there's no real line around them. There's a blue blue stuff inside. But forget the blue stuff. You could the illusory, the illusory line will also contain. Inside the illusory square, the previous experiment I showed you, if you have a real square and you put A, the, the radiation of the, of the neon spreading stops at the boundary. Boundaries are vital in vision, you see. Object, what do you mean by an object? In physics, there's no object, to put it crudely, but the Eddington's table, right? But in fact, in your eye that parcels these things you can grasp, put in your mouth, hit, whatever. Objects are vital for vision. And the visual system knows that. And so it's very, very, very interested in boundary, including an illusory boundary. Put an illusory boundary, stops it from going. And in fact, the leakage is more pronounced for the real line than for the illusory line. Put an illusory square like that, it blocks it perfectly. If you put a real line, it has slight hesitation and sometimes it leaks on it. Why, why is that? And I thought about this for a while. I want you guys to answer it during the discussion. We'll come back. Why is an illusory line, if by this I mean an implied line, you have four black discs and you cut out segments, make an implied square, more effective in blocking the neon spreading than an actual line drawn there, which is in some sense more powerful. Okay, why is that? Brain imaging, synesthesia, red, green, blue, red, confusion, five is red, six is green, whatever. The red red outline is, is V4, color area discovered by Samir Zeki in temporal lobes. Right next to it is a green patch, and that green patch is the uh, number area in the brain mapped out by Tim Rickard in our lab, in our center. Now, when normal people look at it, they only see, they, they see the color, colored, you see black and white, five, there's nothing, no activation, except in the form area, the red line, sorry, that, um, the red line, all right, form area, number form area. So you give them a colored number, the normal people see activation in both color area and form area. Synesthesia, again, like a normal person seeing a colored number, will see activation in both. So that, again, supports the argument. So what do I think is going on? I think what's happening in the fetus, every, every one of these specialized modules for color, motion, Stereopsis, V4 for color, V4 for form and shape, is connected to every other module. There's tremendous redundancy of connection in the fetus, in the early embryo in the fetus, early, maybe early infancy. Then the, there's trimming genes, pruning genes which come along and prune away the excess connections, creating the classical modular architecture of the adult brain. So the color and, and, and form are clearly segregated. But in, in, these, in these subjects, in synesthesia, one in 50 people, this pruning doesn't occur. 
and the segregation doesn't occur. Why? Because there's a mutation in the purine gene. But why do one, one in 50 people have it? It's a useless gene that has been eliminated. I wish Simon were here. It's been eliminated by evolution a long time ago. Why, 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 why would one in 50 people have, have, have this phenomenon? I'll tell you in a minute. I think it's because it's not a useless phenomenon, having synesthesia. It makes some out, supposing that same gene is expressed not just in the fusiform. It's expressed only in the fusiform due to transcription factors, you get number color. It's expressed in the fusiform, you get number color. It's expressed higher up in STS, you get the higher synthesis, projectors. But even imagery is affected. But what if it's diffusely represented throughout the brain? It excess connection. You get an increased propensity towards linking brain areas, activation from different parts of the brain, which in turn would explain another curious finding with, with synesthesis, known for a long time, but ignored as an anomaly, the fact that they will, they're often more creative, quote unquote, nine to eight times likely to be artists, poets, and sorry, synesthesia is eight times as common in artists, poets, and novelists as in the general population. And, and engineers actually slightly lower than in the general population. The synesthesia is much more common than poets and novels. Why would that be? I think I found, I found the answer. That is, synesthesia have more connections across the brain. What is, a, what is art? What is music? It's all about metaphor. When I say it is the east and Juliet is the sun, you don't say, well, Juliet is the sun, but that means it's a glowing ball of fire. You don't do that. But actually, schizophrenics do that. That's another story, right? You say she's beautiful, she's it's the sun because she's glowing like the sun. She's a radiates like the sun, radiant like the sun, warm like the sun, nurturing like the sun. Maybe even rises in the east like the sun, just as you, Juliet, is rising in bed. Okay. All these connections are found in your brain. And Shakespeare, I think, probably maybe a synesthesia. He mastered this. Consider, for example, if I ask any one of you, even those with synesthesia, some, some word for exaggerating, some phrase for metaphor for exaggerating something. What would you pick? Those who have not heard this before. Okay, I'll put you out of your misery. To smooth the ice, to gild refined gold, to throw perfume on the violet, to add another hue to the rainbow, is this wasteful and ridiculous excess. How do you think of five examples in one line to, 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 to convey the idea of exaggeration? And again, that raises the whole question of why do you have metaphors? Why not just say, she's beautiful? You find that using metaphors enriches the experience of Juliet and makes it much more attractive. Why? We don't know the answer to that. We may have some answers, but not in this talk. Okay, so uh, next. So, okay, what I'm saying is the hidden agenda of the synesthesia gene, not, not to make people see colored numbers, the hidden, hidden agenda there is to make some outliers more prone to metaphor, because a metaphor, after all, is linking completely unrelated ideas. Such as Juliet, you know, young woman with the with the with the sun, part of solar system. And the hidden agenda there is creativity and imagination. This is just something about for fun. You look at that, you're gonna tell you about mechanism. What do you see? Can anybody see what that is? Can you read it? If not, I suggest you blur your eyes like that. Blur your eyes. You can just, just see a blurred image of it. Easier to read. Can you now start reading it? It says, yes, what, do you read it, please, yes? Yeah. Can you read it, read it out loud? No sex. Causes bad eyes. Causes bad eyes, there you go. Now that's invisible to you and me because it's been the high, high spatial frequencies in the block, block masking the low spatial frequencies that are conveying the information in Fourier space. One way of describing it. Now, synesthete looks at it. I don't know what that, what that is. I can't read it. Even if you build, I can't read it. But wait a minute, that looks like an N. Oh, no, no, it must be an N because it's red. This is green, so it must be O. This is pink, so it must be S. Then he says, oh, he says no such color by name. So you use the colors, he sees the color before he sees the shape. That's very interesting, right? So you, you can, for obvious reasons. Even more interesting is colorblind synesthesia. If you found two people who have no, who, who are not, not, not monochromats, but color deficient, we don't see the full range of colors, but when they see letters of the alphabet or numbers, they see colors they never see in the real world. 
charmingly refer to them as Martian colors. They cannot see in the real world. Again, why does that happen? So the signals go from the eyeball, the pigments are deficient, very little color processing, but area V4 in the brain, in that brain is intact to com compute in color. Therefore, if you present ordinary stimuli, they're not colored because there's no color receptor in the brain. If you present five, it goes to the brain, activates five neurons, so to speak, and that generates corresponding color. So here's an oxymoron that you know, we can't see colors in the real world. When you show numbers, synesthetically, you can invoke color. Again, supporting our argument about what causes synesthesia. Okay, now I'm coming to an extraordinary phenomenon. Uh, I think I'll skip this, but very briefly, Galton, in the same subject, often in different subjects, noticed that they have a tendency to see number lines or number forms. That is, every number, particular location, is not a particular color, but a particular location in space. One, two, three, four, five. Three. You and I, one, two, three, four, five, six, linear horizontal line. For them, it's 1700, 1900. Extraordinarily convoluted, elaborate line. The number is always sequential. There's no fracture, always sequential. Why? There's an anomaly waiting to be studied, right? Staring at people for a century. People thought these guys were just making it up. Didn't pay any attention. That's where my mind goes. What's going on there? First of all, it is real. But before I tell you about number lines, this is an interesting story. I'll tell you about another phenomenon related calendar lines. If I ask any one of you, Describe a calendar, conjure up a calendar for this year, for next year for me, or any year for that matter. And tell me, what, name the number, show me where the months are. January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December. That's what they do 70, 80% of the time. Another 20%, another 10% will do hula hoop. January, February, March, July, August, September, October, November, December, January. Hula hoop around their waist. Any one of you have, have this phenomenon? Visualizing days of the week. No, no, no. Anybody here in the audience? No. It's not, it's not rare. One in 50 people has this. First thing that struck me was the right handed people, left handed people, the sequence of months is different. It's the opposite. Already telling me there's not some mumbo jumbo. Why do they all get the same phenomenon? Something interesting going on here. What is, what's going on? First, show it's real. Before you embark on a two year study, don't spend one hour showing it's real. How did we show it's real in one hour? For 10 minutes, here's a guy who claims he can actually see the calendar. You and I, by thinking of a calendar, you see something vague in front of you. At least I do. January, February, March, April, May, June. It's a vertical, right? Ramp, left, right, left, right, left, right. Do you see that or what do, you, do you see something different? Either of you. If you visualize a calendar, what do you see? You see January on top left and December on top right, bottom right? Or is it a whole hula hoop? What is it? Or nothing, amorphous. Any comment? Yes, 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 yes. What do you see? Uh, uh, how, how do you mean? The... Like when you imagine a calendar in front of you. Yes. What do you see? What is the shape of the calendar? A calendar? Yes. Oh, usually I will just have a line or so, but I, okay. I don't have a vision for a calendar. I, I've seen in your book where you describe that people see like like circles going through their body and so on i i don't see anything like that okay okay well but you have a sense of it okay so right. basically this is what happens right? so the calendar is in front of the chest or, or floating in front of it in space yeah, yeah. Describe that first. we have to prove it's real how do you do that what we did was simple so you actually see the calendar here, right? do one thing for me if i tell you first of all forget about it tell you do one something for me name the calendar numbers no, 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 months backwards, but subtracting, ah. but subtracting alternate num numbers. So if you say, if I, if I tell you July, if I tell you July, May, you leave one in between. So, okay. In, in terms you... of two, uh, uh, July, May, uh, I have to count it in my head, you know, so it's a bit slow. Uh, May, March, uh, January, November, uh, uh, November, September, July. I'll put you out of your misery. That's fine. Yeah. It's a bit slow, you know. I have to, oh, I have to play through in my brain. <laughs> the average synesthete 
the, the, the phenomenon, that is a three times two and a half to three times the speed. Yes, yes, yes. As you know, yeah. Yeah. what he's doing is he's seeing an image, conjuring up an image, and he's just reading it. If I give you an actual printed one, you have no problem going as fast as him. You just go back, reading backwards. Mm -hmm. okay. So this proved five minute experiment proved they were doing trying to do brain imaging, nothing happened. He spent for thousands of dollars. You find, find it, you can show that it's a real phenomenon. That you can show. And now the question is, where is it happening in the brain? Why does it happen? What is it interacting with? What does it mean? What is its significance? All those questions. The first question, where, where is it happening in the brain? Oh, no, maybe I'll, I'll say that for the interaction. Oops, sorry. Uh, I went too far. Ah, yes, yes, yes. Where does it happen in the brain? So that interesting. So you guys claiming he's seeing the lines, right? So my question was very simple. My question was, do these lines exist? Where are they? Where are these lines? Are they in outer space? Are they in your brain neural, neural activation? In the sensory pathways, given how vivid they are, or maybe high-level computational conceptual concept of calendars by the you and I. Yeah. You have to show that. How do you show that? So what we did was we simply the guy, the lady who had this vertical calendar. Vertical test tube, she said it looked like a test tube. January, February, March, July, August, September, December. Very strange, okay? Like a test tube. I said, okay, let's just do the following. I had a bunch of stripes on the screen, sine wave ratings, for those of you from Trinity. So you get sine wave ratings on the screen, and then you tilt them, tilt the sine wave gradient for 45 degrees or 30 degrees. And you put one vertical line on top of them. You know what happens? Vertical lines tilt in the opposite direction. They're both parallel. If you tilt the background stripe for 30 degrees to the right clockwise, the central target line tilts counterclockwise. Called tilt contrast. Aye. And it's known to have tilt contrast, tilt contrast. And known to happen as early as area 17 in the visual pathways, very early. You don't have to go up high up in the brain. I said, what would happen if he, he she or he projects his calendar on tilted stripes? Lo and behold, the calendar tilts 45 degrees. So it's behaving like a real line. Even more intriguing, what if you, the, the person who sees four test tubes, or two test tubes, four lines, made up of four lines? I said, I want you to look at this grating. Great. Look at this grating. So, oh my God, I see some swirls. Said, what swirls? You see moiré fringes. Moiré fringes from an internally generated image and an optical image on the screen. Mixing psychology and physics in a manner that I've never seen. How can you, how can you take more fingers? But if you imagine more fingers, and I give you stripes, there's no way you're going to see those swirling things on, on the screen. It's impossible. What this is telling you is in these people, the connections are much more elaborate, convoluted, much more extensive, so that the sensory areas are indeed producing almost like a replica of the activation that will be produced by real actual stimulus in the external world, using this back, back connection going backwards. Okay? Let's go back again to the um, to the circle. The circle will, will have February, March, and all that marks demarcated. And sometimes what it does is, at least one or two people studies between, it goes behind them. You say, sir, July, August, September alone are behind my back. How do you know? Well, it's obviously behind me. Everything else is in front. That's not visible, it's behind my back. But when do you take a look at it? No, I can't. It's, it's way behind. I said, just try. So that, uh, and I push ahead, push ahead, like that. Be careful not to break that head. You know? Oh, yeah, just barely visible. Oh, I can see it, Doctor. My God, I see, I can see it. I can see the numbers. I can see everything. I can see the calendar. What was it doing that? This is like another anomaly, right? This one I'm not tackled. I don't know what's going on here. I've seen it in two or three people. Next, here's another lady. With this I'm almost finished, right? There's another lady. Who sees a test tube like thing? There's actually a ribbon. So the lady sees a long vertical ribbon coming down, coming up in parallel, dangling in front of her. That's her calendar. The horizontally marked lines, she, she sees, she lines up, she, she marks it with an line, internal line, no actual lines there. January, February, March. The font is seen. January, February, March. The font. It has to be the right font. She sees the font, she sees the, the orientation, she sees the size, everything. Of this, of this, of the number line, of this calendar line, okay. 
I then say, well, let's, let's look, look, at, take, look, look at it more carefully. Now, this is something that people have been reluctant to do in psychology, in perception, for a long time, since the time of Helmholtz. The last 30 years, it's all about grading and threshold. I don't know why. I mean, I, mean, I, don't, I shouldn't say that. There's some interesting results to come out of it. But by and large, perception is forgotten. And I think we and others are trying to revive it, especially my mentor, Richard Gregory. I don't know how many of you know Richard Gregory. He was one of my many teachers, he, along with all Braddock and others. But, and, and he, he got, lit the fire in me. So I started experimenting on perception. So, so, um, so this lady was seeing this, right? And I said, okay, let's go through one by one. January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, no, no sep September, where's September? October? No, I can't read these things. It's sort of Martian looking. So the right side of this U, top of the right side, instead of showing October, November, December, as you normally would, you start January here, was showing some junk. They look like Martian letters. I can't quite tell what they are. Okay, I want to do one thing. Do you see anything? Else? Yeah, it's, it's twisted. This tape is twisted. What is it, twisted? Then I realized she was seeing a Mobius strip. I said, no, can you go, go back? She said, that's why maybe I can't read it. Go back, go back. I said, what do you mean go back? Go back behind your calendar. It's floating in front of you. Why can't you go back? Well, I, I've not tried that, but I'll do it. You know? said, my God, yes, I'm able to do that. So go slowly enough. Oh, my God, those numbers are all visible. They're actual, actual days, days of the week. The top left. These are all now mirror reverse. That's exactly what you expect from optics. She doesn't know any optics. She's, you know, barely graduated from high school. So, no, wait a minute. No, she, that's not her. It's a different person I'm thinking of. But anyway, she, she's not, not from Trinity anyway. So she, 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 she saw the Mobius strip. Why would she see a Mobius strip? A mirror reversal. Why would she see a mirror reversal? I, lo I love the last finding, which is the most bizarre for the ending. Then we're going to have discussion. Last finding is another peculiar phenomenon you see in synesthete, again. It is called number or letter personification. Galton first knew about it, but it's been studied nicely by um, Jamie Ward and, and a few others. What, what, what they showed was the following. That these people, again, are not lying when they say that Harry is this chap's uh, a big bully. They look at the name, Harry. Then and they say H, the first letter, or indeed the whole name, they're not seeing the person, just the just name. He's a, big, he's a big bully, he's a thief, doesn't respect social values, blah, 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 blah. He's fat, hideous looking, all those very, very precise labels. But he, Johnny, is very pleasant, deserving, very gentlemanly conduct, very helpful. And my mother wants me to go out with Johnny and with Harry, but I, my inclination is with Johnny. <laughs> Some such things she says. So she's also attracted to the pair. Always, always they produce them in pairs. Johnny and somebody else. And somebody else. She's attracted to one of them very often. And this pattern you see quite often. Why the hell would you see this? Why would <laughs> letters of the alphabet produce emotion? Well, I don't know, but you know, the area we're talking about, which is the emotional area, limbic structures, are not that far from. Well, you can only carry this phrenology so far, so be careful, okay? But what's interesting is now comes the interesting bit. On a whim, I said, okay, she sees something and she says, that evokes love, some memories of Christmas, fond memories of my parents, all of that, every time I see it. That's Q. And then L, she says, oh, L reminds me of um, basically just sexual, very strong sexual feelings. And I look at the word L lap or something like that. Lip. And I thought maybe, I, maybe, maybe there is, and I'm starting to think maybe there is some connotation of eroticism. But she says, but now, I said, what if you put two numbers side by side? Interesting. Nobody has done this. Why, why would you do it? Right? You put two numbers side by side, they evoke either they fight, the emotions, depending on what they are, or they evoke a blend. You've seen this with three or four obvious emotions. You're not studying it extensively, but it's, it's going to work, I think. My instincts make it work. So the most striking thing was when, when you look at Joe, J O E, they see sexuality, sexual assignment. When you see Charlie, it's more agape, friendship, religion, spirituality. No, no, no erotic feelings. Put them together, she's on fire. 
my God, that, that romantic, romantic love, passion, but also tempered by affection. That's the real thing. You got both. Now, normally, anybody would brush this and say this is no nonsense, but you've seen it in two people already you know, in a matter of a few months. And then we did the final experiment. Said, what if you draw a line between them? Remember, these people don't know anything about vision. They come out from out of the blue. Things are come sophisticated for us, or easy to follow for us. They don't have, know anything. They just answer any questions naively. Okay? Put a line between them. Oh my God, what? They have the back of their own colors. They don't interact anymore. Their own color and their own personality. They stopped interacting. Remove the blacking, all the interacting points. Okay, so segmentation of the image, which I told you is vital in vision, is influencing this, this, this process of emotions being produced by uh, specific form, the shapes. Maybe a new new language, a new vocabulary of vision that you've stumbled on. But if you, if you put your finger there, in between the R and the Y, instead of a thin line, no problem, effortlessly they interact. Why she was sliding behind the finger? It's called amoral completion in, in, our, in our lingo, in vision, vision language. The brain says, what's the likelihood these pairs are unrelated, they must be going behind the finger. But the line, it could be a real obstacle. Maybe there's a line there, something standing there just stopping it. Across the line, they no, never interact. Across the finger, above the paper, they slide behind it and start interacting. You know, just think about how spooky this is. They're talking about fingers, lines, brains, synesthesia, all of these things disconnected, but in fact, there's a method in the whole thing. The brain is always groping for object boundaries, and here's a clear, clear situation where the boundaries are intact. Now, finally, I keep saying that, finally, I came across a paper by Muku. Muku is in Harvard, and then we recently hired him. He set up a lab in our, at our center. He's been studying with rat, rat hippocampus. You know about the place cells and the you know about the place cells and the grid cells and the hippocampus? You must know that. The cells in the hippocampus is locate location, it's signal location. Rat runs around, stops and around, looks around, it makes the circuits for, for that location. Take it away, bring it next day, when it comes to the same location, the cell fires. The memory of that location you can actually pick out among an array of neurons. The grid cells, there are all kinds of cells with different properties. Won the Nobel Prize five years ago. The exciting thing about the grid cells is you can, you can show them a boundary. They, they fight, there's a boundary cell. The fire one is a boundary, an obstacle. Informing the cat, not the cat, the rat. Don't go there, there's a boundary, you'll bump into something. But it'll go quite close to it, but not, not near it. Now you draw a line between you and the, and the cat, that's enough to show the boundary. Immediately I said, what we have is a neural correlate. In our experiment with synesthesia, neural correlate of the phenomenon the Bubmuku is observing in rats with physiology, single in physiology. I think this is the way to proceed in, in, in our field. There has to be a mingling of ideas. You have to deliberately cross boundaries, despite what I said earlier about boundaries, or because of the, you have to cross boundaries. And uh, we are now in a, very, we are in a very exciting time in neurobiology with all these new tools at our disposal. But the tools are not enough. We want to think of interesting experiments. Of the kind that our friend here Newton did. I mean, who would have thought? Everybody said prisms pass white light, looks colored, therefore there must be some dirt in the in the, in the, in the prism. Then they started purifying the lens more and more. I mean, not the prism more and more, remove all the aberrations and dirt. No problem, it's still colored. But Newton said, Why do you spend 10 years doing that? I can show this to you in five minutes. So he put another prism upside down, the colors went away. Sorry, the colors were preserved. No, sorry, it went away, the white light. If it's dirt spreading more and more color, it should be more colorful. In fact, it can white again. Showing in one single experiment, and this character should all of you in this thing, for the measuring the velocity. You guys know, I'm preaching to the choir. Velocity of sound is measured by clapping and synchronizing the clap with the echo, and taking, taking the distance, and, and dividing it. First time anybody measured the velocity of sound. I'm, I'm saying you can do those experiments now with phenomena like synesthesia or Phantom limit, whatever. And, and you have a lot of fun doing this. Hope you enjoyed that material. Discussion, open discussion. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you so very, very much. This was fantastic. Uh, if you don't mind, if you have a few minutes for discussion, uh, I, like I said before, I would like to ask you a bit about autism because 
we have this lecture coming up of Professor Baron Cohen, and some of his uh, students are attending here also. Mm -hmm. So, and I have seen in your books that you have spent some time working on autism as well. So maybe you can tell us a few words about your thoughts and your work on, on autism, especially also these uh, mirror neurons, which you have also yeah. worked on. Yeah, I can tell you about that. But anybody listening to a talk on mirror neurons by Rudzalati, you get hooked. And when you see these monkeys, so first recordings of these monkeys, where they're responding to another monkey. Yes. Now, you know the whole story. Yes. And I saw this, uh, 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 a colleague of mine was sitting next to me, uh -huh. And I said, these are empathy neurons, obviously, they're involved in empathizing. The obvious question is, are the neurons missing or connections deranged in, in autism? Because that seems to be the primary problem in autism, ability to relate to people and empathize to people. I was not an autism expert, it was just a hunch. Okay? This is very easy to do because there's a new wave, which you can, the new suppression occurs for volitional movements and observing in people. And he said, if you, if you just observe somebody, is that enough to, you have to produce yourself, or what if you just observe somebody to be a neurotic, and you do. They're all being shown. But what about autistic kids? Do they show that? And in a smaller, small sample, we, we did find that. We find that the same thing happens when the autistic child looks at another child. You don't get the new wave suppression of the kind you do in a normal child. So we said there are three, three aspects to this when you're talking about any new procedure or new discovery or new treatment. One is, does it really work? Two, is the logic secure? Is the reasoning secure? It's not necessarily dependent on number one, it could succeed for other reasons, right? Question, does it work? Is, is the logic sound? Then, is, then is, is it useful for therapy? You know, the related question. First question was, is the theory sound? But what I said was, you make a list of things you find in autism, make a list of the deficits you see in autism. For example, um, pretend play, imitation, although sometimes the opposite. But very often imitation, pretend play, lack of empathy, theory of mind, conceivably. Are things that you, find, that you usually attribute to mirror neurons. If you make a list, tabular column of things you attribute to mirror neurons, you, you actually observe in mirror neurons, like imitation, things like that, and you attribute to them by inference that it's mainly involved in not just in modeling action, but impending action, intention, theory of mind, all that is extrapolation from, from, the, from the data. Then I looked at that in tab, column one, column two, look at the deficits in autism. It's a perfect mirror image. Maybe one or two things you see in autism you don't see in mirror neurons. On the other hand, the standard theory of autism, then prevalent, cerebellar theory, you know, this, 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 don't make any, you know, this is, a, this is a, not a good theory, but it's the best one around at that time. And said, let's, let's try and test it, and we found some positive results. Then it went on for 10 years, and about half the world found that you get new air suppression, half the world, how many you don't get it? So nobody knows what to make of it. I'm on the side of, it's, 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 had its innings. So then let somebody else do it, not waste any more time on it. So I don't, and I'm not neither a believer nor an agnostic, as far as mirror neurons are. But as far as their importance in understanding basic neuroscience, obviously they're, they're important. I mean, it's hard to explain why, but to find a neuron that responds to another person moving his hand and then saying, there are people who say it's obvious. Obviously, it's heavy and conditioning. Every time you touch something, the link between your action, your intention, and your, and your touch. So that impending action is then linked to the Hebbian learning to, the, to that appearance of the, of, the, of the thing you're touching. That's why you get mirror neuron activity. Let me, let me explain about it. But that to me is a bit like saying, you know, you've discovered something, mechanism of stereopsis. Well, you know there are neurons in the brain doing it. Why do you want to know which neurons are doing it? I mean, the answer is obvious, but you can't waste your time explaining it. <laughs> I mean, what's the time in, in a haystack you to find one, we pull out one thing and it, it does something as complicated as, as a mirror neuron is doing. Clearly it's functional and, and, and something important, but to that autism, I'm, 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 I'm agnostic. Okay. Yeah. Oh, Professor yeah. Sadato. Yes, uh, uh, can I have a, uh, ask the question regarding the mirror neuron system and the autism issue? Mm -hmm. the, uh, uh, so you've just mentioned that uh, the autism has some trouble in terms of theory of minds. But, uh, and uh, actually, the, its precursors, uh, the joint attention appears to be the problem of the, uh, the autism. And uh, we found that uh, this the behavior appears to be related to this uh, cross-brain synchronization of the 
anterior insula, uh, uh, which oh. is very close to the, uh, the inferior frontal gyrus, particularly on yes. this side. And uh, my question here is that at the, this area appears to have a, at the synchronization, that means the mirror neuron type at the behavior. And right. therefore, at the, at the question here is, what kind of a mirror neuron system exists in our brain? That means you are talking about mainly the so-called lateral type mirror neuron system, which is in the inferior frontal and the IPL, lateral. Mm -hmm. And the certainty in the empathy issue is related to the anterior the cingulate as well as the, uh, the anterior insula, which appears to have the mirror type of the behaviors. Then uh, the question is, is these two systems uh, uh, has a common uh, the characteristics or rather different one? And apparently it appears to be tightly linked, but I'd like to know your opinion about that. Well, I have to be honest with you, it's not literature that I'm very familiar with. I'll have to go and read up on it. And I, I want to do that anyway, because I'm teaching a class right now and mm -hmm. similar to what you guys are doing. When I do that, I'll, I'll reply to you. I feel like I'm not adequately uh, familiar with the, with, the, with the topic. The different places where you find men around. Different. The, the, ones, yeah, the ones with facial expression, I find especially interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ones which respond to your face smiling, but they also respond to their face smiling. Mm -hmm. It's the same same expression, it's very interesting. And, and but anyway, you didn't address your question, which I, I will address when I, when I have a chance to read through the whole literature. But, uh, but the, uh, and this issue could be discussed in the next talk uh, with yeah. Aaron Cohen. Right? Simon Cohen, I'll, I'll be there. I'll be there. Oh, I'll great. Be there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Tanya, do you have a question? Maybe on autism. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Okay, great. Um, just first, I wanted to say I enjoyed your talk so much, even without the slides. Um, my husband is actually off screen listening because we're both big fans of your books. Uh, I have a lot of questions, but I think I'll focus on the one that just kind of blew my mind the most, which is this patient who had his arm amputated. And you say that you're particularly interested in these conditions that are anomalies. But I, I kind of think of the relationship between this with something that's more common, like body dysmorphic disorder. And I'm wondering if you know anything, perhaps that there's a, a similar underlying neurological mechanism, just, you know, at a, it exists on a spectrum with the voluntary arm amputation being an extreme example but maybe body dysmorphic disorder being, you know, a much more milder version of the same you know, kind of underlying neurological cause? Very, very good question. This is just another example of dysmorphia, and it could very well be, but it's a very striking version of it. And in science, it's always easier, you want to get an experimental foothold. Study the extreme version, and then they'll give you clues to how to proceed with the more mild version. Along those lines, the only thing we've done is we have not done that particular series of experiments. One thing we've done along with Jalal, Jalal Balan, Balan Jalal, is my former student, grad student. What we did was experiments where uh, you look at OCD, OCD, where a person wants to is obsessively uh, wants to wash his hand. One, one, one example of OCD, obsessive hand washing. Accidentally touch this or touch a you know knob of a door. They have to go inside the bathroom. With soap and water and scrub and scrub until it's bleeding sometimes. That bad. And it comes every hour, every two hours. Really compromised. You say, well, what does it matter if he does that? It really matters. To them, it's not just the, you know, the scratching, but also the feeling, the urge, very uncomfortable. So we said if the middle neuron system is going to activate, um, you know, neurons in modern pain and all that, and, and we're free will, you want to call it that, what if you, the subject, Instead of going and washing his hand, he looks at an app. You've taken of him in the past washing his own hand. Clicks it and watches it, and he doesn't do anything else. You don't worry about hand scrubbing and you know feeling bad and all that. So you just mimic it, try to fool the system. And we tried it on about a dozen subjects here in Cambridge. Okay, wherever in Cambridge, uh, and, and and back at UCSD. What we found is it, it, it did work. Again, early days. Some of my findings, I would say, there's no doubt, you know, no doubt at all. For example, the time of them. Referral mirrors, 
the uh, optimum epithelium, and several other things I mentioned there. Synesthesia, the entire package. There's not a single flawed experiment there. But this positive business about uh, you know what we were talking about now, the OCD experiment, it's so so wild that I, I find it hard to believe. And but, but how do you rule out confabulation? It's another problem. But but the finding is very really exciting. It's the fact that the person has an urge to, you know, to scratch his hand and, and keep rubbing on it and stuff like that, and compulsion is really bad. You watch somebody else doing it, and it's really, it even, not even him, not even himself. You watch somebody else doing it, and it's really. In the early days, only discovered about six months ago, so he's pursuing that angle. Okay. Kind of odd because we, we, we presented this, my, 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 my colleague presented this at the an annual meeting of the uh, OCD Society, whatever it's called, OCD Society in the United States, mm. and one famous OCD guy with a big billion dollar grant to study OCD, got up and said, um, have you done the placebo where they just imagine they're, they're scratching? And my, my, my friend responded, says, my friend responded, says, but, but, but sir, I mean, don't you think for all these times we've not, we've not tried that? I mean, any patient would have tried that. Imagine the movement. In fact, the prelude to go and actually be doing it necessarily be part of the imagination. So it's obvious to me that, that you know, you, you, can, you can do it if you want, but it's obvious to me that that's the case. The, 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 your imagination will not work. You have to, you have to do the procedure, mirror it. I had to watch somebody doing it. And it helped. I was just—I couldn't help thinking if he, if he had shown that, that the mirror just helped, then the whole multi-billion-dollar complex would, would disappear. Right? Because the whole, the whole livelihood depends on that. Still, in American science, very driven by funding, unlike the Cavendish, driven by funding, which is unfortunate. Right? For especially the younger younger people just coming up, most unfortunate. Okay, uh, is that okay? Uh, Roland, do you have a question, maybe? Roland. Uh, hello? Yes. Hello? Roland? It's not here. Roland, are you here? No. He's not here either. <laughs> he doesn't re reply. Doesn't seem to be here. <laughs> It's my brother. He uh, uh, is he here? No, uh, he's gone, disappeared. Uh, okay, so I think we uh, all had our day. Uh, Davide, do you have a question? Maybe Davide. Uh, so it was very interesting. Uh, as as mentioned, I'm connected from Europe, so it was a great uh, overview and a great discussion. Uh, I'm a bit tired, so I would say for the moment, no questions on my side, right? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I think it's like two or three in the morning in Europe. Thank you so very, very much, Professor Ramachandran. This was Thank you. Uh, such a wonderful uh, talk, so deep. And uh, uh, I mean, brain is kind of central for us. We wouldn't be anything without brain. So it's, it's the center of life. And right, yeah. there's so many mysteries, and uh, I think, uh, despite your big work, I think there are still many, many mysteries left. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I it would be fantastic if you can join the discussion with Professor Baron Cohen, who is the head that. of, of please, please, the please remind me about this. When is the talk with with uh, I, I will send you the details. Of, uh, wait a sec. The date is uh, uh, when is the date? Uh, on Friday, November the nineteenth. But uh, in US, because of the time difference, the date may be different in US. So I'll just wait for your your announcement. Then. It's. I will send you the announcement. In in. Uh, always, on, always, always on a Wednesday, right? Always on a Wednesday. No. Okay. Good. But I'm asking you: Is it always on a Wednesday? It's in November the 19th, 19th November, Friday. And depending on the time difference, it may be Thursday in US. I have to check that. 
Um, and I'm sorry, I'm sorry I didn't check the um, the instrument that Newton was using. So you sent me a lot of a lot of papers relevant to that. I haven't looked at it yet. Okay. So I'd like to look at it now that I'm more, more free so carefully. And okay. Good, good. So do you think it was a synesthete or? Yes. You, you think so? Okay. You no, know I'm saying, do you think he's a synesthete? Newton, Isaac Newton. Uh, sorry? Do you think that Isaac Newton is a synesthete? Synesthesia. Sorry, uh, sound, sound. No, sound. Uh, if Isaac Newton had anesthesia, uh, mm. I don't know. I have to, I think you mentioned it in your book, I think. That's right. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I will check it out. I'm not sure. But he made a, he made an instrument, musical instrument for the uh, first time where the uh, keys produce, produce tones. Ah, uh, okay. Colored, okay, the keys were colored. I, Multi -color. Each color produces a specific tone. So that made me wonder if he had tone color synesthesia. Ah, okay, okay. I didn't know. Well, thank you. Thank you thank so you. very, very much. This was very, very fantastic. Thank you so very, very much. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you very much once again. Extremely interesting and all the best in the meantime. Bye. Yeah, thank you, everybody. And thank you, uh, thank you Professor Sadato, also for joining. Thank yeah. you. It is quite uh, exciting. Uh, yes. Yeah, I, I'd like to attend the, at the next meeting also. And uh, uh, Dr. Faso, if it is possible, uh, to please send me the, uh, the, at the next meeting's invitation for me. Okay, I will do. I will do. Yes, very good. Very okay, thank you very much, everybody. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.